So good evening, everyone. It's nice of you all to be here tonight. My name is Sheila Coronel. I'm academic dean of the journalism school. I'm very honored to be uh, presiding over, not presiding, no one presides over these lawyers. I'm honored to be introducing our um, guest Poliak lecturer for tonight and uh, two other members of our law faculty. I'm sure that uh, our students are familiar with who they are. Um, it's not easy introducing three lawyers. I will try my best. This is the annual Poliak lecture. This um, sponsored by the Poliak Center for the Study of the First Amendment, which was established in 1983 through the generosity of Saul and Janice Poliak. The center's programs have been instrumental in making the First Amendment and media freedom a course subject in our school's curriculum. All of our students are required to take a course in media law, and increasingly now we're trying to globalize, internationalize the way we teach media law, recognizing that we are in a global media environment, that anyone who published anything is all over the world within seconds. Tonight we are happy to present Mark Stephens, a well-known British lawyer, in conversation with John Zucker and Stuart Carl. I dare say that these are among the three best media lawyers anywhere in the world. It is such a rare privilege to have him, all of them, in one room today. Let me just introduce John Zucker first. John, is, John, to my extreme left, is Deputy Counsel for Law and Regulation for ABC. He heads a team of ABC lawyers who work with ABC News, ABC.com, and ABC television stations all around, the, all around the country. They work with a variety of legal issues, such as news content, news gathering, FCC regulations, intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera. The most, more interestingly, um, John, was editor of the Yale Daily News, um, a distinction he shares with Stuart, who is editor of the Columbia Spectator. So there must, be, there must be a career path for editors of college newspapers turning out to be media lawyers later on in their lives. John has taught a media, the media law class at the Journalism School since 2001. He's also taught at Yale, where he graduated and, and other places. Um, he's worked as a journalist, as has Stuart. Um, for the Buffalo Evening News and for the Hartford, Connecticut Bureau of the Associated Press. So Stuart is, um, it is very hard to introduce Stuart. Uh, <laughs> Stuart has many lives. Currently, in his current incarnation, he is partner and general counsel for North Base Media. It's an investment company that invests in media and emerging markets and technology that, and technology that supports journalism. Prior to that, he was um, Chief Operating Officer of Reuters News, and for a long time before that, Principal Lawyer at Dow Jones and Company, where he worked on news-related issues for all the Dow Jones um, holdings, including the Wall Street Journal. Stewart holds the distinction of having the heftiest libel fine imposed on one of his clients, $220 million, but they didn't pay a cent or a penny. <laughs> so it is an adjunct professor of media law here and has been teaching the law class and has been um, training a whole new generation of journalists on how to report securely and safely. And to the star of our evening, Mark Stephens is, speaking of many lives, um, Mark Stephens has defended so many clients ranging from an American artist accused of counterfeiting uh, leaders of the UK miners' strike, uh, James Hewitt following allegations of his affair with Diana, Princess of Wales. He's represented families of the Lockerbie bombing, defended Greenpeace, defended Julian Assange, defended comedian John Doerr, defended presenter Antea Turner, and the Quaker and peace activist Lindis Perry. Um, of maybe of particular interest for you tonight is he's also defended U.S. journalists in two land, at least two landmark cases, maybe more. In 2002, he defended the veteran war reporter Jonathan Randall of the Washington Post, um, who was asked to testify. Am I right? In the in the in the International Criminal Court hearings, he defended the the journalist's privilege during that trial. And that same year. Though it was a big year, you, you also defended the Wall Street Journal in the case of Jamil, which established a precedent in the UK 
for um, the right to publish in the public interest. They will be discussing more of these. This will be a very fun evening. You may not think so because they're all lawyers, but this will be a fun and <laughs> entertaining and also very productive and educational evening. So I turn over the microphones to all of them. Stuart, do you want to lead the discussion sure. and start this? So, so we have to pick something to cover in 45 minutes. So we thought we'd talk about privacy um, because you're all being photographed, so what the hell? Um, abuse wherever. But, um, but to, the idea is to talk about and focus on the differences between the US system and the European, um, and, um, and in particular, an area of privacy that um, Europe just had its first case, which in, involves both privacy and news gathering. Um, and in this case, it was the use of, of hidden cameras, hidden microphones. Um, John, um, in his life, um, particularly focusing on television, is one of the US's most experienced lawyers in dealing with this and, and is not necessarily the beginning, but perhaps the end of that process um, and how both courts and news reacted. But Mark, maybe start from the proposition of this case, Haldeman uh, uh, versus Switzerland, um, sort of what happened there and then maybe we can talk about sort of how it's different and what uh, the, the approach and what the significance of that is. Well, there were four Swiss journalists, um, TV journalists, <coughs> excuse me, frog in my throat, um, who worked for the uh, rather snappily named Swiss TV program Kassen Sturz. Um, and uh, they uh, had got approval from their editors to do some hidden camera filming. Um, there had been problems with insurance brokers giving what might best be described as suboptimal advice. Um, and so basically, um, they wanted to be able to get the evidence of this. And they put cameras in a room. The court came to the conclusion that, uh, A, that there was low quality advice being given. Uh, two, that the uh, insurance broker had a reasonable expectation of privacy. That's the sort of touchstone test that we have, that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy and also a reasonable ex expectation that the information that he imparted would not be amplified through electronic media or any other way. And they noted uh, a rather interesting point, which the was that the journalists, having reviewed the material after they'd recorded it, had only used the really bad stuff, um, which showed, uh, in their view, uh, the high public interest. So by not showing lots and lots of material and limiting it to the really bad stuff, uh, that was a greater justification uh, for the intrusion into his privacy. And the conclusion that they came to was that the broker had uh, a private life, he was entitled to protection of that, uh, he had an expectation of it, but in this particular set of circumstances, the public interest trumped his right to privacy. Uh, and so there was the right for the journalists to speak. Now this is quite important because the essential fact that I haven't told you is that there is a complete statutory bar on doing any hidden camera recording at all in, uh, in Switzerland. So what the European Court of Human Rights have done is effectively uh, put a gloss on a complete bl blanket statutory ban and said, yeah, you can have a statutory ban, but you've got to be able to be flexible enough to take um, where it's appropriate uh, the opportunity to have a public interest defense. And part of that was that we put forward a series of programs which we had taken in the UK, uh, or had been made in the UK, which there, where there isn't a, a, a statutory ban. And so we had things like um, a Channel 4 program about the uh, abuse of corpses at funeral parlors, um, we did one uh, about the abuse of animals at um, uh, dogs' homes and things like that. 
uh, and of course there's nothing worse to an English person than abuse of their dog, um, as you will have seen in Downton recently, I'm sure, um, or if not, you, you've got that coming. Um, and uh, the, 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 sorry, spoiler, yeah. Uh, the, the, the worst, of course, uh, was um, the program that was made about the abuse of disabled folk um, some mentally disabled, some physically disabled, some both, uh, who were physically and otherwise abused by their carers. And I think that it, that gave the court uh, a very clear understanding of the utility of public... Uh, but, but England doesn't have an absolute bar against hidden cameras and microphones. But, no. but so, John, I mean, we talked earlier today about a couple cases which actually... And again, these go, this is the first case to the European Court of Human Rights on the issue of the hidden um, camera, hidden microphone. This goes, there's a history of this in the United States, which is long, tortured, complicated, and has John, made John not a wealthy man, but a well-employed man for a number of decades. And a yeah. well-informed man. <laughs> so well, that's not clear. First, could I ask, could the lights be turned down a little bit so this feels more like a conversation, less like an interrogation? Of, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would just like, and I see several of my students um, in here, so, um, so they know um, uh, that th this approach uh, taken in this, uh, in this British case, or this Swiss case is, is before the European court is very different from the way American courts have treated news gathering issues like this, like trespass, like use of hidden cameras, like surreptitious recording. Because American courts have said, it is not a defense, if you violate the law or commit a tort in the news gathering tactic that you use, the newsworthiness of uh, your report is not a defense. It's, they're, they're not going to balance it. So and a dramatic example of that in California some years ago, um, Group W Productions for a, for a series on uh, EMS workers. Um, Record, did some recording, they put recording uh, device on EMS workers and, oh, sorry, okay. Um, and, uh, and one of them went and um, tended to a woman who had been trapped under a car off the highway and recorded conversation with her as she was trapped in the car and then later as they flew off in a helicopter to, to a hospital. Um, they never showed that woman's face. Uh, they never identified her by name but she did recognize herself by voice and by circumstance. And she sued for two things. She sued for invasion of privacy for the broadcast of embarrassing private facts about her and for intrusion for the secret recording. Um, and the same court, the California Supreme Court, held that no, she lost on the invasion uh, of privacy for private facts because this was a legitimately newsworthy matter they were covering, the operations of, of healthcare workers. Um, but the court ruled in her favor and said she could pursue a claim for intrusion. The news gathering was separate. So the newsworthiness did not rescue um, the, the, the Group W from the tort for the intrusion. And that's a different approach. And uh, do you think this, so this, do you expect this to be carried over throughout Europe? Yeah, I mean, it goes beyond uh, just Switzerland because, of course, it's in the European Court of Human Rights, and that applies to uh, countries as diverse as Russia and Turkey uh, and all the sort of rather odd countries who are not even in the European Union. So think European Union plus all the bits around the edges, and you, you've got... Uh, a major change in the law and approach in every single one of these countries. And I think, you know, you're still going to have to show um, that you thought about, uh, or first of all, that it was, there was, a, it was necessary to uh, reveal serious wrongdoing or criminality. So you're going to have to have thought that going in, so you'll have to have had a good tip or some information which would lead you to that conclusion. You'll have to get senior editorial approval, who will then have to document why they made that approval. Then you will have the secret camera recording, and then reviewing that, there's a second decision to be made about whether or not you're going to uh, further intrude beyond the secret recording, because obviously that's a if you like, a smaller invasion of privacy than to amplify that through the general broadcast 
uh, to the world at large. And so those are the sorts of, and that's the decision tree that we have to make and we have to justify. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly good. If you go back to, oh, there was a, a woman who, an American journalist who impersonated herself uh, into a mental institution in New York, I mean, you know, a century or so ago, I think. And, uh, uh, you know, effectively, it's the same kind of uh, case and test, and uh, there's a real understanding that you can get through this. But no, we have done... Oh. Right, so, 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 a couple, so what, this guy's right to privacy applies, even though, or he, he was an insurance broker, the journalist posed as someone seeking insurance, they met in a, in a rented space of some sort, like a hotel room, uh, so it's classic, in a sense, consumer reporting in that mm. sense. And so, so here, because of the fact that um, the, the newsworthiness does not trump the, the, um, uh, the intrusion because of the, uh, the secret recording, there was a case, we talked about this one earlier, Desnick, which was an eye ophthalmologist, and, and there, you, that, that report was, uh, which you could just discuss a little bit, but that report was protected, but as a result of a change in the law, no longer occurs. Yeah, that, that was an ABC News uh, piece they sent in some of the hidden cameras to a clinic that had been accused of doing unnecessary and actually dangerous uh, surgeries on, on patients' eyes. And ABC sent in um, some patients for whom actually this surgery would be not only unnecessary but dangerous. Um, and yes, it was uh, recommended to them anyway, and they captured that interaction on hidden camera. Um, the clinic sued ABC, uh, and ABC one, because, among other things, um, that kind of hidden camera was, was lawful in, uh, in Illinois at that time. As Stuart mentioned, though, today there was later a change in Illinois law. Um, and under Illinois law, now recording of private conversations is the audio that's, uh, that's the, at, at issue, but the recording would be illegal. And we would, so when someone would come to me now and say, oh, we want to do a piece about uh, ophthalmologists um, and unnecessary surgeries, uh, and we want to capture that conversation, uh, and we're looking at Illinois, I would have to say, despite the newsworthiness and importance of, of, of the reporting, we better look at some other states, because we can't, we, we can't capture that interaction now. I mean, it's quite, it's quite interesting that, the, you know, that's a problem, because the, the news gathering process isn't a problem. I mean, you know, or invariably with hidden, well, not invariably, but very often with hidden camera, there is that uh, impersonation element that you refer to, to Stuart in the sense that you know you go in and you pretend to be someone and you know it's a we have a situation where um, other programs I mean I was thinking particularly of the food lion case over here where you know people were so or food also lines, ABC also ABC how does this yeah. happen <laughs> food, food lion were basically as I understand it um, uh, cutting the green bits off out of uh, out of date meat repackaging it and putting it back on the shelves. Well, and they, so you had somebody go in and, you know, that's perfectly possible for us. I mean, we have, uh, we have to be able to show that uh, the individual reporter hasn't gained, so the money that they're paid uh, as a worker has to go into a trust account and has to go back afterwards. But basically, that's perfectly cool as far as we're concerned. And I've always been gobsmacked at that decision, uh, but it's always down to... That, that, that distinction that you have, which we just don't. Well, but uh, ultimately, in Food Lion, ABC did, did win. Oh, did two you? Call. Yes. Oh, I don't know. We, we, we won almost everything. We, we ended up paying two, two dollars. Um, uh, so the honor was satisfied. On, on, a, on a minor trespass charge. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's, uh, it's, it's interesting you raise that, because one of the things that happened, because the first time I became uh, cognizant of sort of the news gathering torts that you have here, the attack on news gathering by attacking the actual processes uh, was in Food Lion and when that was going on. And I predicted it would happen in the UK and it hasn't. It's taken until basically the last 18 months to begin a process of that. And so we're now seeing claims in trespass, uh, in harassment, uh, in order to uh, try and preclude um, the gathering of information. But do you, you don't think that this, that this sort of approach, that the newsworthiness, the importance of the reporting, would, will trump the news gathering tort 
or crime, would that even extend to a, to a physical trespass? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the courts are basically going to say, well, you know, you walked on someone's front lawn in order to get pictures of wrongdoing, um, a couple of broken blades of glass, that doesn't worth, warrant any money. Um, similarly, I can see uh, situations where people are using drones to fly over um, uh, without anybody's knowledge and effectively trespassing in the airspace. And I think that that, again, uh, is going to be dealt with as an invasion of privacy. In fact, you know, our celebrities now expect it. So if you're buying Hello or OK, and I know that there's some of you out there that are addicted. I can see you are, madam. Uh, <laughs> and I, they, they, uh, it's all our little guilty secret. I am too. Um, and, but now when they sell the weddings and things, the car pulls up into a tent the flaps are let down and everybody walks in under a covered walkway because, you know, there's so many drones around uh, and all the rest of it. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Amal Clooney, who was uh, um, getting married in, in, in Venice a little while ago. And she said uh, she had no idea until she saw the pictures that there were drones all over the, uh, the Grand Canal taking pictures of her going to and from the wedding and wedding reception. Well, dr drone use by journalists has proceeded more quickly than in the US, where it's been held back here by the FAA. But across Europe and most of the world, it is just flourishing and freely, right? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's amazingly uh, good fun um, because we uh, but perfectly happily to you. You don't even need to be qualified. Uh, you, you, anything that weighs up to 22 kilos, and that's basically the size of my wife's um, luggage when she checks in. It's really big. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, that's the, the sort of size of something falling out of the sky. And that, uh, you don't need to be qualified for that. Now, of course... The BBC, being the BBC, have got uh, someone who's a former aviation pilot, who's got a proper license and all the rest of it, and, you know, they notify people and they do everything very properly. But this uh, prevention which you have, which is that if you're uh, the person who took the film or the journalist who uses it does it for commercial gain, then it suddenly becomes illegal and problematic. Um, we just don't have that issue. So if you want to go take drone pictures, off you go. Uh, and the only um, preventative issue is really privacy. Is there an invasion of privacy? Do you have a legitimate expectation? Right, because that, I mean, the oddity about Haldeman and the, the secret camera is that, that Europeans sue for privacy much more, especially minor royals in money laundering countries. And and tend Monaco. To, Monaco, in particular. Um, and, and they tend to prevail at least for some period of time, or they, they, are ex they stand outside uh, wearing either not their tops, either not the top and not the bottom, or not both, and tend to be members of the royal family in England. Um, and they sue and they, they win. They get some sort of money. So there's this protection of privacy, which is really quite um, surprising if you look at it from an American perspective. And yet on something like this, which is American uh, jurisprudence has no problem basically punishing the, the hidden, you know, the hidden microphone in the, in the, in the um, ambulance and wouldn't look at newsworthiness. In fact, it goes the other way there and it's more, you can do more there than you can here. Really quite extraordinary. Yeah, I'm I mean, not sure it's can, rational. I'm not sure which is the better system, but it's different. Yeah, it's, you can gather anything you want. Uh, the question is, can you exploit it? Um, and, you know, so you have... Uh, so, so walk through that. Well... Um, let's, let's take a, a situation which I had to deal with was um, uh, some drone pilots uh, decided that Paris Hilton was of interest uh, and she was doing, um, she was on the Cote d'Azur topless as everybody on the Cote d'Azur is um, and uh, they got the shots of her um, and then the with question... A drone, with a drone. With a drone. And the question was, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, we have uh, similar issues. I mean... So how did you deal with that? Well, we just published. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, they... She had a... Did you do a legal analysis or you just... Yeah, out? yeah, well, yeah, well... well <laughs> There were two things, really, was where would we be sued? And so clearly she could sue us in France, but the French are 
very keen on these legal actions, but they don't actually uh, think much about the term in terms of damages. Uh, she could have sued us in London. The Duchess came up with like 15,000, including yeah. false rights. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if you think about the intrusion for the Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Kate, uh, she, uh, and that was the topless pictures. So they were taken at a chateau in France. Um, it, which has a long tradition of uh, history with the royal family. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the, uh, the, 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 the image was on every national newspaper. It was all over the world. Closer went to about four or five reprints as a consequence oh, of so it. Oh, there's the French magazine that actually published in Yeah, print. absolutely. And uh, so there was a lot of intrusion. So 15,000 euros is not a lot of money. Uh, for that, um, and of course, you know, uh, they've had more in terms of profit. I mean, they probably made a couple of hundred thousand on the back of that. So the economics of that are not a disincentive. The English have taken a slightly different approach in the sense that we do give um, seriously large awards for damages. So for the phone hacking, which we've had recently, um, the Daily Mirror has rather foolishly, in my judgment, um, taken all of these cases to court, and the judges cannot restrain themselves. So the awards have been sort of 150,000, 250,000 pounds. Pounds, yeah. Yeah, and you know it's important to just put that in context. So we don't have jury awards, uh, or indeed the awards like uh, 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 Stuart lost uh, 240 and, million and one. And one, and one, yes, I appreciate it. You, you, you know, you did, did well afterwards. Um, the second We're all time great appellate lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the, the important thing to, re to remember is that uh, if you lose the sight in one eye in, in, in the UK, we've got a kind of tariff for it. We actually have a book with them, all the things in. So it's about 10 to 15,000 pounds for the loss of an eye, permanent loss of vision. Uh, if you, and that, part of the rationale for that is that you've got another one. Um, and uh, similarly, losing the forearm below the elbow, so somewhere around here, um, that's going to be, again, about 10 to 15,000 pounds. So personally, I would prefer to be photographing my top off um, uh, and publicly humiliated uh, than to, to, to have that physical difference. But there, that is the, the, the difference. And in terms of libel, we have a cap on libel of 230,000 uh, pounds uh, so if I call, you know, John a paedophile murderer uh, on the front page of every national newspaper, that's the maximum that he can get in terms of damages. So there are, you know, da uh, privacy awards have kind of got out beyond them. But, but, you know, going back to the chateau in France, the infamous uh, royal chateau, um, which is rented out to uh, or lent to members of the royal family. Charles used to go there with um, Camilla when he was still married to Diana uh, for their summer holiday. So they go away for a month and, uh, uh, well, be together. Um, and uh, one of my clients uh, was a photographer. Uh, who discovered where they went, and uh, so he went down and uh, took a photograph uh, of Charles getting changed through um, the bedroom window uh, in the evening as the sun was going down. And uh, fortunately for Charles, um, unfortunately for the photographer, the sun was on the window at the time, and uh, the photographer didn't have a UV filter, uh, for the lens, which was sort of that long and about that wide. Um, and so um, there was this sort of, well, sort of a glow around the <laughs> crown jewels. Um, and so, anyway, he was not content with this photograph. And the Germans published that, wasn't it, in Bill? <laughs> the, 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 um, the next year he goes back, this year he's bought you know, six pounds 95, a UV filter that will fit over this thing. Uh, and he gets the shot, uh, which demonstrates that A, the moil has been round, and B, that the, uh, uh, you know, you see the full crown jewels and all the rest of it. And the, um, he has the problem. Not a privacy problem, you might think. 
The problem is that nobody will publish it because it's too rude. Um, except, of course, the Italians. It's always the Italians, isn't it? Well, the Italians came up with a rather ingenious solution. Um, and what they did was they put, um, uh, put it on the front cover of a magazine and put a black box over the crown jewels. And on the black box, it said, for the full uncensored uh, image, take a two euro coin and scratch off. And you've got all these Italian matrons <laughs> scratching away. Uh, which I thought was genius. Uh, evil genius, but uh, uh, genius nonetheless. Okay, so that's one aspect of privacy. <laughs> and the, or not. Or, or not, or not. Always change indoors, it's a reminder. Uh, but then other aspects of privacy and a difference with the US would be uh, what's commonly known as the right to be forgotten, which is actually the right to be harder to find or the right to be obscure. And if I can find this, Ah, there it is. Um, so, so this is this is the thing, right? Yeah. This is so, what this is what we're all concerned with. Right. So, so what this is not about. I'll start with that, and you can say what it's about. It's not about. This is the original notice that reports this guy has a financial problem. Yeah, in La Vanguardia. Not, it, and and that's on their website, and it's not about taking down off their website. This is about something different. What's this about? So this is uh, the actual print edition of La Vanguardia. Um, and uh, under Spanish law, when you had financial... This, by the way, is the guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so, so you'll never forget him. Yeah, this is, a, <laughs> this is the most famous deadbeat in history, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, if you meet him, ask him what he did 16 years ago, but anyway. <laughs> but he became slightly embarrassed uh, about this uh, uh, thing, and uh, it, w it was the only when he put his name into the Google search engine, it was the only thing that came up about him because he was pretty anonymous. Um, and so he wanted this to be forgotten, that he'd moved on with his life and he was now a successful lawyer um, and uh, no longer a property dealer and so on and so forth. And so he took this case uh, on the right to be forgotten. And now this is a form of privacy law that we have. It's a, uh, a, a, a data regulation and basically it says uh, that you have to, uh, the information has to be up to date, it has to be accurate and uh, it has to be proportionate and all the rest of it. Um, it has to be relevant basically. And so, uh, right, he so you, you delete it if it's inadequate, irrelevant, no longer relevant or excessive. Yeah. That's what I, my favorite part in relation to the purposes of the processing it issued, the processing of the data um, carried out by the operator of the search engine. So yeah. what, what could be excessive is a whole separate question, but anyway. Yeah, but I mean, you know, basically what you've got is, uh, he's saying it's no longer relevant. It's effectively, you know, yesterday's news. And so he, he wanted it removed. Now, he tried, he initially started proceedings against La Vanguardia and Google, but dropped the case against La Vanguardia very quickly because he recognized that there's a, a defense, which is that journalists are entitled to keep material in their archives for journalistic purposes. Um, so La Vanguardia are in the clear. But Google is merely a search engine, according to the European court. And as, as a commercial search engine, they are obliged to process data, that is, they're, suppo they're supposed to behave appropriately in relation to data, and they don't get the journalistic exemption. So anyone who doesn't like a story about themselves or believes it falls into the categories uh, can now apply to have it removed uh, or effectively airbrushed from history because you are delinked. Uh, the right to be forgotten is quite an emotive term, uh, but basically it's delinking. So it's like going, uh, I think it's a bit like going into a library um, and leaving the book on the shelf, but taking out the library card that tells you where it is. So, you know, you could spend months and months trying to find it, but you probably wouldn't bother. And that's really what this is about. And there are many hundreds of thousands, many millions of them now. Um, them being requests. And requests for them to come down. Uh, they, about 48% are successful um, in terms of them. Uh, but the, 
the tension really is now, uh, whereas people were happy just to have them removed from uh, .uk or .fr for France or .sp for Spain, um, now people want them removed here on the .com domains. Right, so, so the US, if this happened, what happens, John, under US, US law? Well, uh, nothing. I mean, un unless you have a good old-fashioned kind of libel suit or invasion of privacy suit, and you go after the original publisher. Um, but Google and the search engines, uh, it, it would not be liability. It's a non-live, yes. it's non-viable. Right. Um, I actually, there, some of my students will have uh, just written an essay uh, for me about, would they recommend um, that this sort of right to be forgotten um, be enacted in the U.S.? And, it, and if it were enacted, if there were an attempt to enact it, would it be constitutional? And um, uh, overwhelmingly, the class said something which I, with which I agree, which is that it could not, it could not leave, uh, lawfully be enacted. In it would be found unconstitutional. Which is what the tension is. So the French regulators are the one, I think, most actively pursuing this, but they are corresponding monthly with Google saying you've got to take this off Google.com, not just off Google ES or, or FR. And Google's so far refusing. Presumably that gets litigated now, right? The, the, well, yeah, what the, the decision that's come Europe, down. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 they took it to the uh, highest court in Spain, and then the highest court in Spain referred it to the European Union court, uh, who makes the definitive rulings for the whole of the European Union, uh, because our laws have to be harmonized um, they go back to data that's regulation. That's this one, but the issue of taking it off Google.com, that's at this point regulatory, oh, yeah. right? So what, yeah. yeah. Well, that I, hasn't gone to the, the European Court of Human Rights has not ruled on. No. Yeah. Just France. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a number of countries are coming up with very similar things because of course there are German citizens, French uh, uh, and Spanish, but you're right, the French are being particularly aggressive about this, but so are the Germans. Um, the Germans have got a very particular view about privacy. Um, I think a lot of it is informed uh, by uh, Angela Merkel's experience, their chancellor, on uh, her growing up uh, in East Germany, in a Stasi state. Uh, for those of you that have seen the movie, The Lives of Others, where you know people are bugged uh, regularly, it was something that she finds, or it does find, personally very, very distasteful and uh, problematic. And I think that, and also the disclosure by Edward Snowden that the American government was listening to her telephone calls, I think didn't improve things. Um, so they, there is this, att this attempt to, or tension where they want to push because they see it as an ineffectual uh, or half-hearted remedy if you take it off um, European uh, domains but leave it on .com. Right, but how do, how do they exercise jurisdiction? So, so assume none of them like it. Do they, do they fine Google France, which then puts the fine back to Google California? Do they, they if they come to this country, they, it won't work, right? They can't, they can't actually get an order out of the US court, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, it's, 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 it's a problem because what they're doing is they're fining people who don't have the power to do it. So uh, Google's um, corporate structure is Google Inc., Google Ireland, which is the holding company for the European Union, and then each company, country of the European Union has its own company, so there's Google France. So Google France is basically an advertising sales operation. There's no mechanicals, there's no uh, ability to control data. All of that is held, um, and deliberately so, in California. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, th that's the structure that happens. So what they're trying to do is to exercise such pain on uh, the sub of the sub that the, um, the, 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 the mother company will take action or will be forced to take action. So daily fines have been addressed. Um, only two to 3,000 uh, euros a day. Um, but over one. Over incident. one incident, and you've got to remember that there are literally hundreds of thousands of those. Um, so, yeah, and so uh, those are the sorts of uh, issues that we're seeing uh, in, in, in play at the moment. But it's this issue of jurisdiction and who, who can do what where. So 
So John, tell us about that picture and what, ha what happened to the United States. Well, probably, does anyone in, th in this audience know who that white-haired gentleman is? Paul Weller. Where are you from? I'm so pleased. You must be from <laughs> Woking, sir. A minor figure here in the U.S., as, mostly as leader of the, the rock group, the late 70s rock group, the Jam, and then later the Style Council. But he knew the whole history. He gave me five minutes on this. <laughs> <laughs> I but, um, with. I think but it's still an a major, but still a major figure in England, apparently. Right. Yes. So, no. um, <laughs> and small country. This photograph is of him and two children. Is that right? Uh, of yes, his twins. Yeah. Um, resting in a cafe in Santa Monica, California, um, snapped by a paparazzo, um, whom Weller actually then confronted. The paparazzo assured him that uh, they would not show the children's faces, but then they went on to do so. And this and a whole series of photographs um, published in the mirror, in, in, in a British tabloid. Um, and Weller. Online, online. Online. And, but, but it, British publication. And, and Weller um, sued in England. Um, and even though he and the court acknowledged that the taking of the photographs was lawful in California and that publishing them in California uh, or New York or the US would be lawful. Um, he successful, his lawsuit in England against the British publication was successful because of their um, feelings uh, that the privacy of the children deserve protection. I mean, this is a really interesting development and we're seeing it increasingly used. Uh, because, of course, countries which um, don't have protections for privacy or don't have, uh, as far as celebrities are concerned, adequate protections for privacy are nearly all signed up to the International Covenant for the Protection of the Rights of the Child. U.S. is. Everybody is. Uh, even, you know, some of the Gulf countries are. And the key to that is that they, when you get the letters before action in London, what they say, because I mean, the immediate thing you say is, well, it was published, it was taken in America, you haven't got any legitimate expectation of privacy given the local law. They then say, well, you're not remembering the international covenant on the rights of the child, and the child is the person who brings it. And of course, in this particular instance, although it's Weller who's angry and it's Weller who's giving the instructions to the lawyers, uh, the case is brought in the name of the children. Right, so the, the, the woman with the glasses is actually his daughter, identified in the caption as his wife. That was one mistake. But the children are 10 months old. And they got, I think, 5,000 each because of the trauma they suffered <laughs> at the age of 10 months for having their pictures uh, published. Well, they're pram photographed, yes. But, I, I mean, it's an easy mistake with the wife. I mean, she's, uh, the daughter's 16 and the wife's 26, so, you know. I, <laughs> Weller is 54. <laughs> Allegedly. And, and total damages were 10,000 pounds. So, again, it goes to the... But, the le but in England, the legal fees would have been well, in the hundreds of thousands. Of yeah, no, I mean, his you, legal fees. No, yeah, well, yeah, well, not in this case. But yes. I mean, you get, uh, you get uh, the the key thing in the UK is that the legal fees are going to be expensive. Uh, they did a survey a few years ago on libel cases, uh, but privacy cases are the same. Basically, uh, it's 150 times more expensive to sue for. Uh, libel or privacy in the UK uh, and Ireland than it is anywhere else but, in Europe. But see, this where Mark and I got to know each other was over 15 years of litigation over these forum shopping libel plaintiffs. So Russians came into the um, UK, Middle Easterners came into the UK, Arnold Schwarzenegger went to the UK, Liberace won the lawsuit proving he was not gay, um, uh, or it couldn't be proved that he was gay. Um, so he won damages, Elton John won damages on the same point. Um, and by and large, we got rid of that through forum non, basically saying you belonged in a different court. But privacy now is extremely attractive to run the same arguments. And those cost objectives, since they're going to go in front of judges who will be disinclined to approve pictures of children or pictures of whatever else, they're going to be in a very friendly court. Um, they'll all talk about the children. And in all probability, what you'll see is a surge of this stuff as the firms migrate away from defamation and into privacy, no? Well, it, it's already happening. We're seeing, uh, I think we've had four libel trials this year, um, but we've had something like 40, 45 uh, privacy 
trials. So that gives you, which in you know a smallest jurisdiction is a lot, uh, well, and there's a significant like, normal cases. Think of the, the 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 multiple of that that's settled because the prospect of losing yeah. a case. I mean that's the tip of the iceberg, um, and so as a result of that, and if you get a, a letter before action, even in a libel claim, um, you invariably get. Uh, a privacy claim and a data claim at the same time. And they are sort of interchangeable. I mean, if you think about it, um, uh, there was a guy called Max Mosley, who's a Formula One, or was the Formula One boss uh, for the Grand Prix racing. And uh, he um, decided uh, to uh, entertain um, four or five prostitutes in a Chelsea basement. Um, and one of the prostitutes had uh, what's, uh, well, that well-known news gathering article, uh, a bra cam. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, she sold the story to the news of the world and uh, they published it all over the front page. And uh, he sued um, for libel in Germany and he sued for invasion of privacy in the UK. Uh, his... his um, his libel theory was, because um, the, the News of the World's headline was um, uh, Nazi orgy. And uh, so basically his theory was um, that this was a common or garden British orgy and he was entitled to the extra diminution in value and loss of reputation for it actually being wrongly identified as a Nazi orgy. Um, so if we just said on the headline, uh, good British orgy in Chelsea, presumably he wouldn't have got any uh, libel damages. Anyway, um, he won his privacy case and set the bar for damages at about 60,000 then, but they've gone way up from there. There's no jury, they're all being set by judges, and judges are finding very fact-specifically uh, ways of uh, getting at uh, higher awards. So they starting to break down uh, the wrongs, the torts, they're starting to say, well, you effectively looked at uh, somebody's private material on several different occasions, so I'm going to give you the maximum award each time, so we're going to total them up. So, okay, well, they, in, they, they went into your phone records, we'll give you 50,000 every time they did it. So four or six times they did it, that starts to get to be a meaningful, sensible number. And part of that, I think, is a sort of policy decision that the judges are making, which is to exhibit their distaste at what uh, some of the... Uh, less classy ends of the English media uh, have been up to. It, it does seem that English law and European law presents a greater degree of subjectivity and, and lodges it in the judge than American law on news, on news gathering and, I'd say, privacy. That and, and defamation as well. And, uh, yes, and defamation. defamation. Yeah, and I, I, think part of the, I think part of that is, of course, we have to remember that... Um, or we, although we bequeath the legal system to you, we don't have a, a, a constitution. You have a constitution. You have a Bill of Rights, uh, all of which are meaningful and uh, uh, have an effect on the way in which your law is in, interpreted and actually allows people to speak openly and freely and, and all the rest of it. And we have this uh, rather peculiar situation where... Um, We've never thought that people should have the right to free speak freely, and so our libel laws are very claimant friendly. They're, even now, I would think 90% of cases are run, won by uh, claimants. Uh, so it really is, I mean, that's why it's called the libel capital of the world, because you basically have to be a moron in a hurry to lose a case there. Um, and then, of course, what's happened is as we've joined the EU uh, and also we signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights, increasingly these continental notions and the case law from the continent about privacy uh, have come forward. So, you know, the sort of uh, ideas that sort of emerge from France, but many of the other 
countries uh, where the president can have four or five mistresses but not a single newspaper will report it because of their privacy laws. Um, those kinds of laws are coming in, uh, you know, up our rivers, into our estuaries and uh, uh, into the streams. And that really is affecting the way in which uh, the legal system is responding to claims and uh, the problems of uh, uh, what are perceived as invasions of, uh, by the media. Great. So, so um, sort of our time is done, but does anybody have any questions, uh, comments? Anyone would want to assault Mark? He's good at it. Um, He's robust, he can take mic. it. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, thanks for, for being brave. <laughs> sure, I'm just hoping um, you or any of you would speak a little more about the extraterritoriality of these judgments, because it's not just France, but there's also Canada, British Columbia um, court issued an order against Google to take something down. In Australia this month, I think, did the same of removing a defamation link. You're sort of seeing the Commonwealth countries kind of draw ranks to kind of punch holes in Google. And to me, it just doesn't seem good, but where is this going to end and what next? I think it's a, it's a very pertinent question, and I'm glad you asked it. Thank you. Um, the, what I do is I start off by looking at what would we be doing if this was um, a company selling widgets or undertaking some business abroad and you look at whether they've got uh, a business in the country that you're doing business in are they selling products there what what is the structure that you're looking at and invariably um, it's difficult to get jurisdiction over somebody who's not there or jurisdiction over somebody who is uh, it's merely a subsidiary and what uh, the continentals are doing particularly is attacking uh, these tech companies um, through their subsidiaries which I think is just jurisprudentially wrong um, but it is what they're doing and I think it's, it's setting very bad precedents because there are when you play this back the other way so let's say Iran decides to start making judgments against or take something le somewhere slightly less controversial, Turkey, which has a big um, sort of clothes industry and other kinds of industry. You start playing those back the other way and you want to um, have proceedings brought, but you have deliberately set up a subsidiary in Turkey uh, which has very limited scope. All the decisions are actually made back in London or New York, it doesn't much matter then in those circumstances, you know, that corporate structure should be respected. The laws the world over have been designed to respect that corporate structure. And what we've got here is a situation where they're not respecting the corporate structure. And I think that is the problem. They're not playing by the rules anymore. And that's going to set really bad precedents in just trade areas, in not, irrespective of the ICT parts of it. And I think they're looking at saying, well, you know, these people can effectively broadcast into our jurisdictions or they can communicate into our jurisdictions and therefore we should be able to do something about that. Now, just take that one stage further. You know, the Turks don't like it if you say rude things about Ataturk. Um, you know, he's a national symbol. And uh, effectively, they've attacked YouTube uh, and other... Uh, online uh, spaces where those, those indiv individuals have um, said things about Ataturk which are not entirely praising. And I think, you know, we're starting to erode at this notion of individual rights and all the rest of it. And that's why I made the point that, you know, in Spain, um, it was an advertising sales office. That's all it did. The data wasn't even held in Ireland. There was no data held in Spain. No executive, no employee had the power to do anything in Spain. And it's only people at the head office in California that have the power to do anything. So what is happening is that there is an abuse of the legal construct that we have devised for centuries 
of the corporation. Well, and that those countries were fully participant in. They, they yeah. wanted to get the local office because they wanted people to basically advertise. They wanted people to market globally. And so what they're doing is they're sacrificing that participation, potentially, at the altar of this fetishization of these, these issues. Yeah, there's, no. there's nothing about this that's, that's, that's inaccurate. No. It's a question whether it's been around too long. And, and to elevate that over the ability to participate in a global technology economy. And, then, and there are probably other reasons for this as well. But that's what they're doing. And the question is, at what point does the cost get so high for the Googles that they simply say, you come to California and contract with us because we're not going to bother. We're not going to have Google France. Or Google France will actually be run out of servers in California. You yeah. can do that easily enough. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, the, I, mean I think it is important to say that you know, the, the right to be forgotten stuff applies to honest, truthful information. Right. Never, never forget them, never forget them. <laughs> and this is, you know, the, the, the advertisement was a statutory form advertisement required to be put in by legislation in Spain. Sorry, yes. Hi, <laughs> I'm another, another Brit in the room. Um, you talked about it briefly earlier, that, that you've obviously got this tension now between um, undercover reporting and this public interest test, and then the idea of trespass. And I was wondering if you, if you think you're going to start seeing public interest sort of coming in as almost an, an excuse to trespass in these situations, and whether you could then see that extending to things like theft and um, surveillance in terms of uh, voicemails and phone hacking. That's a, a very good question. In fact, um, I had a case uh, over the last six weeks uh, where um, the target went to... Um, uh, criminal lawyers to advise and what they did was that they laid a trap so when uh, the journalists went round to the office uh, by appointment to interview senior executives for the article um, they had slipped onto the signing in book key documents um, which were relevant to the story. And we managed to get hold of the video uh, footage of them actually putting them there. Uh, and, of course, the journalist did what any good journalist would do, was pick them up and took them off to read them. Um, there was no intention to permanently deprive, no intention to steal them, but obviously you want to take them away, you know, look at them more carefully. And so what they were trying to do was then prosecute and criminalize the journalists through theft. Uh, and that was what the game, the game that, that, that was afoot. So we are seeing um, people really starting to push the boundaries on these things and attack uh, in a very aggressive way uh, the news gathering side of things. Uh, but I think we are going to see increasing problems with, with news gathering. Because of course when you know, as it is the case in Australia at the moment, they don't have privacy laws like we have, like the UK used to be before the Continentals infected us with their privacy. Then in those circumstances, um, you know, you can still, you know, do long lens photography, you can still uh, pat people, you can still do all of that stuff there. Um, and that, I think, is, is quite an interesting tension because you're going to find this patchwork around the world when some countries where you can do these things and some countries where you can't. And what do you do when you cross borders with the images and the, and the, and the, and the information? So I think that concludes it for the evening. But if we can all give a, a round of applause to our Thank three you. speakers this evening. Thank you so much, and especially to Mark, thank you so much for coming uh, to visit us tonight, and we hope you all stick around for the reception in the back of the room. <laughs>